Hey everyone, it's Turnip. The people have spoken and they wanted me to rank all the maps in Halo Wars from worst to best, and I'm gonna do that today. I'll also go over useful strats, which leaders work the best on each map, and cover all other areas of importance on every map. Now keep in mind, this is based off my experience and this is just my personal opinion. So please down below in the comments after you've watched the video, I would love to know your favorite 1v1, 2v2, and 3v3 map. All right, thanks everyone, enjoy the video. So we have to start somewhere and if we scrape the very bottom of the barrel of Halo Wars maps, the hands down worst map in the game is Labyrinth. Now don't get me wrong, the map is incredible looking, it's got an awesome art style, and it's, it's fairly balanced in terms of bases and spawns, but there's just one little thing that makes this map terrible, and that is the Forerunner Protector Factories. These guys here, you can run your scout immediately over, shield your scout, and then send the offensive protector onto the enemy base and attack within like 30 or 40 seconds and it can be very very difficult to deal with most games revolve around who can take control of this hook first and send it over to the opponent's base there's even some glitches which i do not condone that you can make these protectors unkillable and you can park them in front of your opponent's base let them sit there and the only way you can really stop them is if you have a cryo bomb or I think a Mac blast can can work, but there's just a, it's awful. 2v2 map, it has six forerunner expansion bases, which are protected by sentinels. A long corridor down the middle for just quick access to the enemy base. And then there are two side teleporters that'll take you to either end of the map and various sniper towers scattered about for extra vision. Now, if people played this map without the Sentinel Factories or the Protector Factories, it would be a half-decent map. It would probably rank somewhere up in the middle of in terms of maps or maybe even higher. It's just nobody likes to play it because of how abused these are, and it just comes down to shielded goshog battles. That's really all that happens on this map. So Labyrinth is a beautiful map, but it ranks dead last because of all the jankness that happens and all the trifling caused by these Sentinels. Best leaders on this map have to be Anders due to the heavy reliance on Warthog play for this map. And for Covey, it would be Brute because who doesn't love a nice shielded Brute Chieftain? Clocking in at number 17, we have the snowy 3v3 map, Glacial Ravine, aka Turtle City. This map is two wide open ice plains cut in half by a very large ice mountain range. There is a small gap in the center where ground forces can move through. However, there are also two laser walls here that can hold back your enemies. Some people may look more fondly on this map. Back in the day, this was a DLC only map, so that means everybody on your team and on the opponent's team had to own the DLC, and you had to go through the map rotation process, so it wasn't even guaranteed you could play it. That's why it was so rare to actually play on Glacial Ravine. This map encourages very defensive play as it's often that people are going to take the center very early on. So that cuts off a lot of the usual strategies like Goss Hogs or tanks and leads to more airplay. What tends to happen too is everybody just sits back, does nothing, builds up their forces, and these games can be dragged out for a very long time, sometimes over an hour long just to finish. A lot of Covenant players like to do the Scarab strategy where they park their Scarab up on the, the mountaintops and the ground forces can't attack them. On Glacial Ravine, you want to take the walls early in the center, deny your opponent from scouting you, and I recommend you build an air force to attack enemy expansions and move around quickly. A great way to win a lot of games on Glacial Ravine 
is after your air army is defeated, you're secretly amassing a large amount of tanks or ground forces, and then you get some vision on your opponent's side and sneakily pelican your entire army across the mountain range. Then you're a force to reckon with because you've got so much open space you can move around. This map is also one of the two maps that has the Sentinel Factory, a little different from the Protector Factory. This has the Standard Sentinel and also the Super Sentinel. The Super Sentinel can stun ground targets, be it infantry or even vehicles. The three best leaders on this map are going to be Professor Anders for the ability to cryo and then also the Hawks, Captain Cutter for the ODST control and spamming those anywhere you want, and lastly it's going to be the Prophet of Regret for his ability to get the flying upgrade and fly over the mountain range and hot drop the Covenant units wherever he needs them to go. It's a very, very powerful late game tool. So that's really all there is to know about Glacial Ravine. Kind of underwhelming map and tends to play out the same way every single time. Arriving at Stinky 16 is the 1v1 map, Barrens. Barrens is in the same boat as Glacial Ravine because they were both in the same map pack. So many people didn't get to play it very often. Barrens is one of the two multiplayer maps that has a Forerunner Spire of Healing in the center. So that provides for a lot of interesting gameplay dynamic. And there are also two bonus reactors in each corners. Barrens is essentially a giant Z or a giant Z shape where you snake through the center of the map, avoiding the flood and reach your opponent's base. My least favorite part of this map is just the design of it. We already had a Flood 1v1 map, and this just feels like that with some some bonus reactors on it and the Healing Spire. It's just, uh, in my opinion, gets old. Uh, there's a lot of people that will only grind this map for some reason. I just I see the same players, and they're only playing uh, they're only playing Barons, and they're only playing like Captain Cutter or something like that. So there's some people that absolutely love this map. I am not one of them. This map is great for Covenant players. The center Spire of Healing will heal up your Chieftain, your Prophet, or your Arbiter and uh, allow you to continue on with the fight. The Arbiter is especially strong on this map. Uh, the ability to rage down Warthogs and take over those uh, bonus reactors early on can really, really push the battle in your favor. There are plenty of strategies you can do on 1v1 maps. Especially when, when they have bonus reactors, you can go into Quick Tech 2, like Wraiths or Locust, or you know get faster tanks out, do little unconventional strategies. Uh, the main thing you want to do is lock down that center ring of healing. Once you have control of that, you want to deny your opponent access to the bonus reactors, and you want to take them for yourself so you can get the tech upgrades like Goss Cannon, Scorch, uh, Repeating Cannon, Power Turret and just keep your enemy in the stone ages best leaders on barons are going to be for unsc professor anders for her quick access to warthogs and the upgrades on them especially the goss hogs and then captain cutter he can use his elephant to lock down the uh, reactors and also get those uh those nice upgraded uh bases early on for covenant it's going to be arbiter and brute Arbiter can deny Warthogs access to to your base just because it's it's just kind of like a there's there's nowhere they can really hide on this map. And then Brute is just so aggressive, can walk right over to your base, drop a bunch of brutes down, and it's it's tough to deal with unless you know it's coming. So that's Barons in a nutshell. Next up we've got the 3v3 map Exile, another flood map, and boy this is a barrel full of monkeys. Exile is an elevated ring style map. We have a ring in the center and then a ring in the middle. And lastly, there is a ring on the outer edge that houses the uh, bonus reactors as well as a lot more expansions. The unique part about this map is that everybody starts with a free expansion next to their own. So it's very commonplace for you to take your own base immediately as the game starts. So you can start uh, building up on two bases. 
I do think exile can be fun at, at times. There are some kooky things you can do. You can make infantry work. Um, you can steal the opponent's base and build turrets on it and <laughs> start shooting their buildings. Uh, it's uh, pretty interesting. Just like barons, you want to take over the reactors ASAP and stop your, your opponents from taking theirs. Typically, the person on the bottom ring is going to get pounded by the enemy team. Uh, that's one of the downsides of this map is the spawns you can't control. So you could have your best player spawn on the bottom and just get smashed or vice versa, your worst player. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of RNG based positioning so it can be it can be frustrating the map has a lot of choke points which can turn some engagements into meat grinders if things get stuck behind one another and uh yeah no fun there best strategies on exile are going to be uh just getting into those late tier units getting the reactors getting your upgrades uh, power turret is a must goss hogs if you're fast enough and then for covenant you can typically get into Sacrifice Banshees very easily, or you know, even Bum Rush for a Scarab if you wanted to. I, I, I don't recommend that all the time, but it can be fun to uh, take both the reactors and have your opponents feed you and get like a Scarab out in five or six minutes. I brushed on this a little earlier, but if you do manage to take the bottom ring on Exile, take your opponent's base. If you put turrets up, they will be able to shoot uh, some of the buildings on the sides or the edges of the opponent's base. I recommend if you are the person who spawns on the top ring or the furthest from the center, you should tech up as, as much as you can because you're going to be the, the safest when it comes to engagements. So uh, use that extra time to uh, research a lot of uh, upgrades and get your, get your army strong enough so you can come through and save the day when need be. Best leaders on this map are going to be Professor Anders for the cheaper upgrades and faster upgrades. And then we're going to have Captain Cutter because he gets the better expansion. And this map is very heavy on Expos. And for Covey leaders, we're going to go with Arbiter just because the ability to rage everything is so good. And also Brute Chieftain for the very early aggression again with the Brute Squads. Yeah, Exile is not a terrible map, but there's just some things about it that can put a put a turd in the punch bowl relatively speaking uh there's there's ups and there's downs i'd say that it's mostly downs but yeah what can you do sliding into some of the better maps we're, we're climbing up there we've got number 14 terminal moraine an icy 2v2 map terminal moraine is one of the most unique maps in the game it features two island bases that house a reactor and also two bonus building slots. Typically, it is a race at the start of the match to claim these building slots and put some supply pads on them to get that eco boost versus your opponents. You have to position your scout at the beginning of the bridge here and wait for it to activate. And then it's a race across the bridge to see who can claim them first. The bridges are powered on a one minute cycle. They're on for one minute and then they're off for one minute. At the start of every match, you need to be checking the timer. And at that one minute mark, you better be ready to get across the bridge. If you get the good side, you can actually put up a hall or a barracks and you can take an infantry squad and move it into the good reactor. The other side is the bad side because the rebel snipers will actually target your uh, warehouses and also you can't take over the reactor without having to fight a turret or a bunch of rebels. Also behind each of the main bases, there is a small pocket of uh, highly veteranized rebels. There's not much reason to go back here and fight them unless you want to get the crates from killing them. So yeah, mostly avoided. Uh, the reason Terminal Marine is lower down on the list is just because the matches are decided so quickly. If you do not, if your team does not get those those hooks, you're at a very large disadvantage. Especially if you miss out on the reactors, you're not gonna be getting your upgrades as fast as your opponent and you're gonna lose that edge really early on. The typical matchups you see are a lot of Goss Hogs, a lot of Scorpion Tanks, and or uh, plenty of Banshees and Vampires. Those combos are pretty frequent and tend to be the the bread and butter of 2v2s. I know what you're saying right now. Well, turnip, 
I absolutely hate fighting over bridges. I hate fighting and trying to push and shove to get to the front of the line and cross a light bridge. Well, I've got the answer for you. You can take your pelican and kind of cheat. Park one warthog on one side and then park another on the other side. Pelican said warthog across the channels and you can use the vision to pick up those uh, buildings a little bit earlier. You always want to try to secure the good side. Uh, typically split the pads up between your teammate if you can, uh, but preferably give them to the UNSC. They, they need them a little bit more. The best leaders on Terminal Moraine are going to be Captain Cutter, Professor Anders, and then for our Covenant, the Brute Chieftain, and also the Arbiter. Arbiter is very useful in a lot of situations. Uh, on this map, you typically do not want to play Sergeant Forge because his supply pads are so much more expensive. It's very hard to uh, buy those side, side buildings easily. So yeah, to wrap up, I, I really like Terminal Moraine. I feel that it's a very fun map. You can have lots of good times, but uh, it can be unforgiving if you've not mastered the art of, uh, of fighting for that bridge control. At number 13, we're going back to 1v1 maps. This is Release. Release is... It's like vanilla ice cream with no toppings on it. It's, it's great. You enjoy it. But it's fairly simple and, you know, just gets the job done. Release is purely about skill. There is really no advantage resource hooks or reactors anybody can take on this map. So it comes down to who's just the better player and who has the better micro. So this map is also unique in the fact that there are two flood release nodes, only place in the game that these exist, where you can take control of them with an infantry and release swarms of flood AI on your opponent's main base. Sounds cool, right? Well, it is cool, but it doesn't help very much because these flood are very weak and they can be stopped fairly easily. It's not a game-changing play or anything like that. Highly recommend it if you're planning to troll somebody. A very, very good trolling uh, tool. Or if you're trying to veteranize units, uh, which most people aren't in like competitive play. But if you want to vet up some, some tanks or something, you can park them right outside and just kill all the flood that come out. Also, every time you release the flood, uh, the price increases for the next release wave and also the amount of units or uh, uh, types of flood that come out. The map is shaped like a giant U, and there is also these flood bases all around you can take for your expos, and they're guarded by these wimpy little flood tentacles that can be easily outranged by a warthog or, you know, like a prophet or a wraith or banshee or something like that. Very simple to take these over here. The main gameplay mechanics are going to revolve around uh, positioning on this map. So catching your opponent's army off guard, uh, denying their expo, and you're taking yours, that sort of thing. Scouting is crucial. You want to know where your opponent is. Uh, a helpful tool is to check the score of the opponent, because if they've uh, destroyed their base, you can see if they have any score, because they will if they've killed that flood base, and it can help you determine whether or not to, to attack or not. The matchups are fairly the same. You're, if you're UNSC, you're going to go into Warthogs first and then transition into tanks later. And if you're Covenant, you're typically going to go either into Wraiths or Banshees. And also, you're going to attack very early on too. usually rush them. The best leaders on release for UNSC, Sergeant Forge for his Eco Bonus, and then Professor Anders for Gremlins and upgrades, etc., and for the Covenant side, we're going to have the Arbiter, uh, the ability to take on the Warthogs. That's mainly all that people build on this map, so that's crucial. And then the Brute Chieftain for the Brute Squads. Brute Rushing still as effective as ever. So that is Release. It truly tests your skill versus your opponent's. The final Flood map we're going to talk about today is our number 12 spot, which is the 2v2 map Crevice. Crevice is very similar to Exile, uh, the fact that everybody starts off with an extra expansion slot, and there's also four reactors scattered around the map. 
Just like on Exile, your goal is to take control of these reactors ASAP and get your upgrades going, try to out-tech your enemy. Typically, just like on Exile, you want to take your base immediately and start getting those warehouses or supply pads going. Crevice is very close quarters. The central ring is guarded by lots of uh, AI flood, so it can be hard to navigate through there. There's lots of choke points in this map, so uh, close quarters combat is on the regular, and units can get bottlenecked pretty easily. I love the amount of variety that there is on Crevice. With these fast reactors, it can lead to some pretty crazy plays with uh, some special units like brute, brute squads with jump packs, or even cobras, you know, setting them up at the choke points, moving them into position. I can't stress enough, on maps with reactors, especially this many, you need to take control of them, or you're just going to lose out in the long run to your opponent's upgrades. The reactors on the far corners of the map are a lot less defended than the ones in the center. Typically, you can take a infantry and just walk it right into the reactor with no resistance. The flood that are there defending it will just die from the, you know, from the garrison troops. You can do this in the center, the center reactors, but it just takes a lot more micro. You have to avoid the little flood spores and carefully walk your infantry through or have something clear them out beforehand to, to take control of the center. Crevice is the only map to feature a day and night cycle. Every few minutes, the map will get darker and then brighter with the cycles. Also, according to the map description, at one point, the Flood were supposed to attack you during the nighttime. They were going to come out and attack your base. But this feature actually never happened, never came to be. I don't think it did in the 360 anyways, but it definitely does not in the Definitive Edition. No Flood will spawn or attack you. Some of my favorite strats are in Crevice are to go for a very fast power turret or for a fast goss hog. As Covenant, I love to do leader rushes with upgraded special units like jump pack brutes or maybe get the very first upgrade on the suicide grunts and then take down an enemy expo with a bunch of suicide grunts. You want to be careful of these small garrisons that are next to the natural expansions. If you get rushed and your opponents throw some infantry in there like brute squads or marines, be a real pain in the ass to try to get them out of there and it's a good way to put a lot of pressure onto your opponent's natural best leaders on crevice again we have professor anders for those very cheap and very quick upgrades makes the best use out of those those bonus reactors then we have captain cutter he gets the nicer base when you take those expos so it's always a nice play for covenant we have the brute chieftain the Brute excels at dealing with early Expos, so if you can get in there and put a stop to your opponent's expansions, you're going to be doing just fine. Couple that with the fact he can take those reactors very, fairly easily because his Brute Squads do so much damage, you can just drop them right on in there. And lastly, we've got the Arbiter with the Suicide Grunts for denying those Expos, and also his Rage is just very strong. Use it on goss hogs use it on tanks anything you really want so those are my thoughts on crevice it is a more difficult map to learn if you're just starting out so definitely watch some people play it uh, but overall i rank it a little bit higher than some of the other maps just because of the variety and the amount of strategy that can occur on crevice at number 11 we have repository quite a fun map it is another 2v2 map, and yeah, let's talk about it. Repository has a ring style map, so you're gonna have your outer ring with two expos and access to the enemy bases, and then you have your central ring, which houses more expos, and then you have the central hub, which has a sentinel factory. This is the same exact type of factory that we saw on Glacial Ravine. It houses the super sentinel, as well as the standard sentinel soldier around this factory here there's oh, quite a bit of supplies that are on the ground they're guarded by uh, five or six sentinel squads and you want to make your priority early on to try and gather as many of these crates as you can maybe send your covenant leader up there or get some some gunner hogs and clear it out uh, it's just free money begging to be taken definitely take advantage of it 
behind each team's main base, there is a single open base slot that either you or your ally can take. If you have a UNSC player, you definitely want them to take it versus the Covenant player, just because UNSC is more of the powerhouse and the game enders, so they need more of that eco so they can get their units upgraded. Repository can be a difficult map to hold down an expo on, besides the one that you get behind your base, uh, because you and your opponents both have an equal distance to get there. These bases on the sides are scouted very often when somebody walks to and fro. So if it's discovered, it's probably going to go down very soon. The Super Sentinels are actually somewhat decent on this map. Uh, not so much on Glacial Ravine, but on this map we see a lot more usage of them to stun enemy tanks, maybe some Warthogs. Uh, they actually can put in a good amount of work here. The typical strats you're going to see, uh, same for most 2v2 maps, is going to be either a combination of Scorpion tanks and Vampires, or Goss Hogs and Banshees. So, in my opinion, I still think the Goss Hog Banshee combo is the best, um, but you have a short window to perform it. So, if you allow your opponents to get teched up and get a lot of tanks out, I think in the long run you are going to lose, but uh, a good player should be able to shut down your vehicle depots and also use the Goss Hogs to kill any vampires that are out on the field. Uh, and then the Banshees can come in and clean up the rest, clean up any tanks, or uh, you know start stripping some buildings down. And let's get into the leaders. So, same thing, it's gonna be Anders, Cutter, and then we have Brute and Arby. Those are gonna be our best performing leaders here on Repository. One thing I did forget to mention, on those maps where you get a free expo at the start of the match, typically you do not wanna play a Sergeant Forge, just because once he takes that free expo, uh, he's not gonna have enough money for, uh, for pads on that base, unless he gets clicked by his teammate or they, they send you money. Um, so when I am on the other side of that and I see a Sergeant Forge has taken that free base at the start of the match, it's a really good opportunity to rush that forge and take out that base ASAP. There's not too much more to say about Repository. It's a fairly balanced map, very simple to understand. Um, that's one of the reasons I like it so much is uh, very approachable from all angles. You just got to know little details here and there, but overall a very solid map. Okay, we're moving on to the top 10. These are my top 10 favorite maps. Uh, starting out with number 10, we have Beasley's Plateau. Beasley's is a very unique, very interesting, and quite fun 2v2 map. Each of the bases start out in their own corner, and close by to each of these bases are two extra building slots. So each team has a collective of four on their side of the map, four extra building slots. This map also has something that is specifically unique to Beasley's, and that is the Forerunner Life Support Pod. So what this does here is if you're able to clear out the Rebels and take this over, you will get a plus 10 to your population. It does sound nice on paper, but more often than not, these, this Life Support Pod is not picked up by either team. It's kind of out of the way, and plus 10 population is not very much of a difference um, and people tend to just ignore it and close out the games before people even reach maximum population. What will win you the games though on Beasley's is the hook control. Um, so there's a total of eight hooks to, to take over and a lot of the gameplay revolves around taking them from your opponent and making sure you and your teammate have the best advantage. You want to make sure that this is your priority as soon as the game starts and try to uh, claim your opponents for yourself. Now alongside these little hooks there are uh, turret slots that you can create a turret in and either help defend your own hook or steal your opponents and use it to shoot down their hooks. There are six extra expansions on this, on this map. So going back to the strategy of this map, Typically, what you're going to see is a lot of Warthog play to take control of the hooks, and then a Covenant offensive is going to be very, very fast. 
One thing that a lot of people like to do with the Brute is to immediately take the Brute, run him to your opponent's resource hooks, and then drop a Brute Squad in the small garrison that is found behind every hook, and use that to clear it out and deny your opponents uh, their extra buildings. You could also throw up a hall or a barracks on one of these hooks and use it to put some early infantry pressure onto your opponent's main base. Another small tip is to try and share every hook you can. And what I mean by that is you put a warehouse down and then your teammate takes the other warehouse for themselves. That way if one of you two loses your hook or you lose that side, uh, you're not going to be down two supply pads. You're just going to be down one because you are sharing with the other side as well. So typically on Beasley's, the strats you're going to see once again are going to be either Goss Hogs or Scorpion Tanks, followed up with primarily Banshees or Vampires uh, for support. Best leaders on Beasley's, once again, we have Professor Anders for the reasons I've stated previously. And then Sergeant Forge. Him taking these little supply hooks isn't as detrimental as him having to take a fresh expo, so he actually does okay. Then we have the Brute Chieftain for the Brute Squads. You can drop them into the little hook garrisons, take those over, uh, and then push onwards. And then also we have the Arbiter. Those extra uh, resource hooks are going to give him a lot more money to, to rage, so that's very, very useful. So that is Beasley's Plateau, one of my more preferred maps. And again, you want to make sure you take over the side hooks. That should be your priority, and that'll lead you to victory the majority of the time on this map. At number 9, we've got Blood River, one of my favorite 1v1 maps. The map is separated by a blood-stained river, and there are two Forerunner supply elevators, one on either side of the river, and same goes for the Forerunner reactors one on each side of the river in the corners. Blood River is a very fast matchup, very fast map to play. The games don't last very long. Uh, your first objective is to take over the Forerunner supply elevators. Those are crucial. Supply pads in Halo Wars work a little weird. So they have a scaling system. If you build one supply pad, that one operates at 100% capacity. But the more you build, they start to work at a reduced rate. So if you, say, have three supply pads, for example, those are not producing 100%. They're all working at 70%. The Forerunner elevators are not affected by this slowdown at all. They give you the same resources, about the same as what a, what a single heavy supply pad would do. So they're not diluted at all, and they're a great resource to take over. After you gain control of the resource hooks, Definitely try to take your reactors, get those upgrades, get the beam rifle, get the canister shell, etc, etc. Your marines or your infantry are not going to be able to take these reactors over just by themselves. You'll need at least two to three squads to do the job or have your covenant leader clear them out. This map is all about fighting over that hook control, seeing who can maintain it the longest to get that edge on the opponent. Make sure you take over the two sniper towers that are right next to the elevator because if your opponent gets in there and they start shooting at your, your elevator, it's going to be difficult to get them out of there. You really need building clearing units like jackals or flamers to get them out. So definitely put some troops in there and don't let them take that for free. Some of my favorite strats on Blood River, if I'm playing as Covenant, I like to do the early Locust Rush take one of the reactors and then push on with some locusts or for UNSC you go right into go right into tanks and go into canister shell and then just start spamming tanks as many as you can typically you don't expand on this map you don't clear the base out because if you have all of those hooks that's really compensating for an expo and you just play off one base primarily so best leaders on this map, again, this is my opinion. I'm gonna say Anders for the upgrades, Sergeant Forge for the heavy pads, and for Covey, we're gonna have the Brute Chieftain as well as the Prophet. Now, this map may be one of the Brute's best because he can immediately take those, those hooks over so quickly with those Brute squads and possibly take the opponents as well. Now, the Prophet, why I like him on this map is he can make 
quick work of any of the sentinels that are guarding either the reactor or the elevator. Now the one downside is that his honor guards cannot fight back once they're in those garrisons. So you want to get a haul up and put some grunt squads in there to compensate for them. Whereas the Arbiter has a very, very tough time hitting Sentinels with his Rage ability. It's, it's near impossible. So you have to be aggressive on this map. You can't really play back and play on the defensive. You, you've got to take over those hooks. You got to get that extra money from the resource elevators and claim those reactors so you can win out in the long run. So that is Blood River. Very fun map. Definitely one of my favorites from the DLC expansion. All right, we're just about halfway through this mofo, so feel free to take a break if you need it. Pause the video, come back at a later time. If not, sit back and let's get ready for the rest of the top eight. At numero ocho, this is Perth Outskirts, another 1v1 map. Perth is a contender, and I believe it is actually the smallest 1v1 map in the game. It is quite a firecracker of events. Perth is a circular shaped 1v1 map. There are two ways in and out of both of the main bases. There are also four extra expansions around the map, around the circle, and two of which are open. This is the only 1v1 map where there is an open expansion available to take. Behind these two extra bases, there's also a single bonus reactor, which you can do any sorts of shenanigans you want with. I would say Perth is one of the more difficult maps to learn. Unlike a lot of the maps, this map is very, very dependent on the matchup. So whatever matchup it may be, which leader is against which determines the course of events. Pair that in with a free expansion and two bonus reactors. So many kooky things can happen and a lot of unorthodox strategies take place like rocket marines or uh, tons of ghosts everywhere. Typically, it's going to involve taking your expansion, trying to maintain more Warthogs than your opponent, and hold down the reactors to secure the essential upgrades for the victory. If you're playing against Covenant, it can be somewhat harder to hold on to that expansion, but then again, it really depends on which leader you're playing against. Brute is a lot more difficult than, say, Prophet. Just like Blood River, the matches tend to go very quickly. Lots can happen, ups and downs, so hold on to your pants. This may be the only 1v1 map that Captain Cutter has any sort of edge on. That upgraded base he gets when he constructs, is comes in, it comes in handy. Especially if you're dealing with an early rush, the ability to put turrets on it helps out. With the other reactor maps, this one is no different. You want to take your reactor ASAP, and it's kind of like the ones on Crevice where you can just walk a squad into the reactor and take it with minimal resistance. I'd say the, the most effective strategy has to be Goss Hogs. Goss Hogs or, or Wraiths, those are, those are my two favorites on, on this map. You can also get away with Marines, Banshees never hurt either. So best leaders, like I was saying, Captain Cutter. And then we're gonna have Professor Anders for the Gremlins. And then for Covenant, we're gonna say the Brute Chieftain. And then the Arbiter. Arbiter is great on this map. So close quarters, can catch a lot of Warthogs off guard. So Perth is a very fun map. Lots of variety and variety is the spice of life, they say. At lucky number seven, 3v3. We've got the Frozen Valley. Frozen Valley, very wide open, lots of space to fight in. 3v3, so you know there's lots of chaos going down. Glacial Ravine is a wet fart in comparison to this map here. Frozen Valley has another Forerunner Spire of Healing right smack dab in the center. This is the last one we will see on our list. And Frozen Valley has two bonus reactors that are in opposite corners from each other. Frozen Valley also has 10 extra expansions that you can clear out and take so you can build up your muster. You and your team want to make sure you take control of the Spire of Healing to keep your Covenant leaders healthy and your armies well kept. That's gonna win out your long battles. 
Now, there are also the reactors. You want to share these. Everybody should send an infantry squad over to make use of and uh, share. I'll also make this quick note that this side, this reactor over here, is considered the good reactor. Because if you build a marine or a brute and you place it inside, it'll actually kill this expansion by itself. And it will not be out of range of the turret. So it won't just die to the turret and you have to waste extra time to kill that turret. Also, lots of ice walls that surrounds the, the crust of the map on the edges. So Covenant players like to do the little scarab strat and walk around on that impassable terrain. Because of the size and the vastness of this map, the name of the game is Speed. So your best performing units are going to be, once again, the Goss Hogs and also Boost Banshees or Sacrifice Banshees. Hit and run is very, very effective on this map. There's just so many ways to go and so many avenues you can take to escape. It's really effective when you want to kill some expos and get out. Great map for hawks as well, flying the hawks everywhere. Uh, also, power turret does great. Just need to position them carefully. You can't have all of your forces on one side of the map and then the other side gets attacked. That's a really easy way a lot of games are lost on Frozen Valley is positioning. Try to have your forces spread out or clustered in the center so if one side gets attacked you can go and defend or go on the offensive. Taking an expo is key. You want to get that extra eco built up so make sure you expand early and take advantage of how large the map is. Just scout your opponents and make sure you're not getting rushed and you should be able to come out on top in the end. Okay, number six, best DLC map in the game. This is Memorial Basin. Memorial Basin is a very close quarters, open map with a, a large hill in the center, kind of like a mound shaped. In the corners, everybody gets a free expansion. Isn't that wonderful? And then behind the two original bases, there is a bonus reactor, one for each team. And then in the center edges, in the contested area of the map, we have two bonus building slots and two Forerunner supply elevators. And those are split up on each side. Also scattered about on this hill here, there are tons of little garrisons you can put squads into. And at the very pinnacle, there are two crashed pelicans that you can you can garrison. Memorial Basin is crazy. I would say it's it's maybe the craziest 2v2 map, just because of all of the stuff that's going on on it. There's just tons and tons of potential and different strategies you can try. Because this map is so small, you can potentially make any kind of unit work. That is one of the beauties of this map and couple that with there is bonus reactors you have ease of access to those units so you're not locked behind the tech wall these matchups tend to snowball fairly quickly the team that holds on to the reactors the longest and those supply elevators usually is the one that comes out on top infantry is a great choice for this map especially like brutes like grunt brutes that's really strong uh, warthogs are especially strong just the mobility and being able to clear out all of the side hooks fairly quickly. Speed is your friend here. If you're fast, if you can get lots of troops out and you can put them in the right spot, you're gonna do just fine. There's really not just one thing to do on Memorial Basin. You can kind of go at it whatever angle you want to. You know, you're gonna have your bread and butters like your tanks, your goss hogs, your banshees. Uh, you could you could make things work like wraiths or hunters as well. They they aren't penalized by that mobility as much because this is a very very tight quadrant. You do tend to see a lot of anti infantry units like flamers and jackals to clear out those supply elevators because holding on to those again is super important. Now as for the extra bases, it's similar to Perth outskirts and sometimes you'll take it sometimes you won't really depends on which leader you're actually playing against be it are you playing double brute you're probably not going to want to take that expo best leaders we're going to have professor anders cutter and then brute and rb 
because they're just the meta in this game. So they work well on just about every map. So that's Memorial Basin. Let's uh, move on to the top five. All right, we are down to the nitty gritty. Thank you so much if you've made it all the way to the top five. So number five, we have Tundra. Tundra is another 1v1 snow map, and it is one of the most unique maps in the entire game. Very, very unique. Tundra is home to the Mega Turret. The Mega Turret is in the very center of the map, and controlling this is really going to help turn the tide in your favor. This Mega Turret is the only player controllable Mega Turret throughout the entirety of Halo Wars, and it's found right here. This Mega Turret does a lot of damage. It's great for destroying supply pads, vehicle depots, and putting a lot of pressure onto your enemy. It's quite difficult to take over, but if you manage to pull it off, you're you're pretty much your shoe in at that point. Most high level games on Tundra tend to avoid the Mega Turret until about the mid to late game. If the games do drag out that far, it is essential to your victory. Tundra also houses a few laser walls as well, making this the only non 3v3 map to have laser walls. I think Tundra is fantastic. I think the layout is very nice. There are two bases on your side of the map. There's one that's kind of a hike, and then there's another one that's closer to your main base that is a little more difficult to take over. Typically, you want to take over the stronger base because having it closer together means it's easier to defend. There are no hooks on Tundra, so there are no extra reactors, nor are there extra supply elevators. So strategies for Tundra typically involve, if you're UNSC, you're gonna get out early Warthogs and take over the map control, try to harass your opponent. For Covenant, you're going to get your leader out on the field and do the same thing, harass your enemy, and usually gonna go into Banshees or Wraiths. If it's UNSC v UNSC, it's gonna be most of the time Warthogs into Scorpion tanks or Gremlins. Covenant versus Covenant, those matchups end very quickly. Usually you're on the aggression immediately and just you try and base race each other. There's lots of different things that can happen in a 1v1 matchup. My best advice is to scout as often as you can and try to pick up more money than your opponent from the crates. That will give you an edge. So that is most of what you need to know about the Chili Tundra. And in my opinion, one of the better maps, one of my more favorite maps. Okay, clocking in for number four. This is Blood Gulch, an iconic multiplayer map turned into another iconic multiplayer map. In my opinion, I think Blood Gulch is the most difficult map to learn in the game. And why is that, you ask? There's just so much going on that you need to manage and understand and know about. It's very difficult to put it all together, but I'll do my best. So we've got a long corridor down the center, and then on the outer rim of the map, we have two Forerunner supply elevators and two bonus reactors. So it's very similar to Blood River. However, behind each base, there are also teleporters. And these teleporters will send you across the map right next to your opponent's reactor. The most important part about Blood Gulch is locking down the two Forerunner supply elevators. That is key, just like on every other map that they exist. They give you that extra income, and if you have more money, you're going to be able to do more than your opponent. Secondly, the reactors as well. You got to keep those under control. You got to get your upgrades before your opponent does. Try to get into things like canister shell, goss hog before they have a chance to get really anything done. So it's a balancing act. If you spend all of your focus on holding down the sides, you may leave yourself vulnerable at home to an attack. Or vice versa, if you give up all of the hooks on the map, it's going to be really difficult to deal with any frontal assault or try and try and attack the opponent because they're going to have all this extra resources to use. 
building clearing units like flamers or jackals are very important to very important to have send them out take claim over those hooks there's lots of different build orders and strategies you can go through i recommend you check out some of my games if you want to see something that i would do and there's also tons of resources out there in the halo wars discord that shows the build orders and proper strategies for our best leaders on blood gulch we have the queen anders for everything i said before those half price upgrades and reduced time on those upgrades is very essential captain cutter we can use his elephant to maneuver around and take control of the resource hooks this may be one of the brute chieftains best maps Depending on which spawn you get, it is very, very easy to steamroll somebody with the Brood Chieftain. Especially if you take both of the money hooks and you throw up two hauls and just start spamming some grunts out. Very difficult to stop, very difficult to deal with unless you know it's coming. I'd say the Arbiter is a close second contender for the, for the next best covey on this map. The Rage and also the Suicide Grunts are, you know, Decent at taking out buildings and stripping things off. The map is not entirely symmetrical. The spawns have their ups and downs in terms of advantages or disadvantages. The eastern spawn, for example, behind the teleporter, there tends to be a lot more crates than on the western side. Like, I'd say two, two and a half times more. The trade-off, though, is that eastern side's forerunner supply elevator is not as easily defendable. It's got two ways up, which can be quite annoying to deal with. Um, it's a lot easier to lose than the western sides, which is only one way up. And you have to kind of go a little bit around to get up there and send a warthog into this little crevice and pelican your troops up to take control of it. You know, when I'm building warthogs on this map, I, I always wonder, why are we here? You know, it's one of life's great mysteries, isn't it? Why are we here? I mean, are we the product of some cosmic coincidence? Or is there really a god watching everything? You know, with like a plan for us and stuff? I don't know, man. But it keeps me up at night. Moving on to the top three. The cream of the crop. The best 2v2 map in the game. It is the Docks. The Docks is an iconic map. Beloved by all and is, yeah, in my opinion, the best 2v2 map in the entirety of Halo Wars. So what makes it so great? Well, it's very balanced. There are no real gimmicks to this map at all. The only thing is each team starts with a free expansion. Typically the UNSC player will take this, and yeah, you wanna take this every time to keep, uh, keep on par with your enemy. In the center of the map, there is a small, narrow passageway with a lot of garrisons for infantry. I highly recommend you take one of these and just put something in there for the vision because this is the only way that land forces can get to the other side of the map. So it's very important to know what's going on here. The docks has a similarity to release in where there's impassable terrain, a large group of skyscrapers that divide the bases. Uh, it's really effective to take a bunch of banshees and hit and run over this and maybe pelican some forces across if, you're, if your enemy team is out of position and they're more down towards the chokehold area. It can catch a lot of people off guard and sometimes even win you some games. So the typical strategies that you'll run with on the docks as always, Goss Hogs, Hogs are great, uh, Scorpion Tanks, you can you can even try some Cobras, I, I like to try Cobras here if there's multiple UNSC, just because there's very little ways that they can, they can maneuver in this map, so setting up defenses, it can be effective at times. Covenant players are going to go primarily air with sometimes a combination of Hunters, uh, it really depends on what the matchup is. If you get multiple UNSC, you can probably go Hunters and be, be okay, but not too often. There are also some Rebel bases that are on the outer edges furthest away from the spawns, 
and there's a small ring, small road you can take that'll kind of sneak around and attack the natural expansion of your opponent. I highly recommend coming in from that angle. It catches a lot of people off guard and you can split your units up, but just make sure you don't get trapped and you don't get your uh, your tanks or your, your Warthogs cornered back there because there's no other way to get out. Also, each of the natural expansions has a small garrison that you can put some infantry in. Uh, brute chieftains like to throw brutes in here to make it a lot more effective of a rush. So yeah, my final advice with the docks is just be very mindful of your positioning. You don't want to get caught with all of your troops out of the way or on the other side of the map. Just keep try to keep eyes everywhere and watch for some watch for sneaky players. Okay, we're getting very close to the end. Just a reminder to drop a like and make sure you comment down below what your favorite 1v1, 2v2, and 3v3 map are. Let's dive into the best 1v1 map in the game. This is the Chili Chasms. Now, Chasms is just fantastic. It's so great. It's very simple. There are two Forerunner elevators, but besides that, it's just wit against wit. The reason I love Chasm so much is it's very close quarters. I said Perth may be the smallest map, but I think Chasms might actually be a little smaller. I could be wrong though. Uh, the bases are pretty much facing each other. There is a small roadway that leads directly to each base. And then there are uh, side passages that you can use to sneak around the opposite sides and hit a, hit a flank on your opponent. Because this map is so small, really anything goes. You can use infantry, you can use vehicles, air, whatever you can really muster. I I don't really think there's a bad unit on this map. Maybe like choppers or cyclops, but I've seen ghost strategies, I've seen marine strategies, really anything you can think of, locusts, jackals, flamers even. There's just so much variety with, with chasms. It's it's a big reason why I love it so much. It is imperative that you take your Forerunner Supply Elevator as quickly as you can. That is going to secure your long victory. And if possible, try to steal your opponents as well. That's just, that's just gonna help even more. I would say try to go for yours first in most cases, unless you really think you can uh, take theirs over with little to, to no resistance. Also, there are a few sniper towers that are scattered about the map. You want to focus your attention on the two that are in the center, and sometimes the two that are next to the elevator, but the, the most important are the two in the center to give you that vision on if your opponent's pushing up through the middle, and it'll also give you first line of sight in case you, say, have a tank standoff. It's much better to see them first before they see you so you can get the first shot off or the first canister shell and uh, get that advantage. I typically tend to see less warthogs on chasms. Don't get me wrong, you're, you're always gonna build warthogs regardless, but they tend to fall off a lot faster than other maps just because the mobility isn't as big of an issue here on chasms because every unit can, can get around with no problem. I would say that scorpions and wraiths are your main bread and butter on on chasms here just because they're heavy hitters and they can they can hold back the hogs with the with the choke points that are all around now there are two expos on chasms but they tend to be very underutilized most games are decided very quickly so the expos are not even taken and if they are well, you've got a huge leg up on your opponent if you can manage to get it up and hold on to it. Uh, but most people are, are scouting very frequently, so if they see that you have that up, it's a perfect time to, to push in if it's just just starting out and try to try to take you out while you're while you're vulnerable. Well, yeah. So shoutouts to Chasms, great map, gotta love it. Try it out. All right, let's get down to business now. Was there really any doubt in your mind of what number one would be when you started this video? 
I think everybody who's ever played Halo Wars knows and loves the number one spot, 14. Hands down, the best Halo Wars map ever created of all time. 14 was so good, they even remade it in Halo Wars 2, the only map to be remade in the sequel. So 14 is a large open battlefield that is split evenly down the middle by a variety of laser walls that can block your opponent off. And then each side has a plethora of expos they can take to build up and, you know, try to take over their opponent. Lots of strategies, lots of combinations you can do on 14. There are two distinct sides. There's a plateau side that is entirely concrete and has two ramps that lead up to all three bases. And the other side is a little more open and has a wider plane of field. Both sides are gonna have their advantages. I would say I prefer the concrete side a little more just because those ramps are more easily defendable than the more openness of the, of the, the grassy side. Now that does come with a few drawbacks. On the concrete side, the player that's in the center is vulnerable to attacks from below via locust or canister shells, they, those attacks can actually shoot upwards and, and damage the structures. Also, each team has a teleporter behind their bases that will port units to the front of the enemy's bases. Usually for the sake of speed, if there's a covenant rush happening, everybody's going to use this teleporter and kind of just run through the uh, run through the rebels here and get that quick port over to start the offensive. Now there is a lot you can do on 14. I'm by no means an expert. I know there are tons of players that grind 14 and there are lots of competitive people that know this map like the back of their hand, but the the main most effective strategies is gonna be Goss Hogs. Their speed and their agility makes them essential to close out some games. Uh, if you can deny your opponents from getting their expansions, that's gonna, that's gonna win out your game in the long run. Banshees are also very effective on this map. Their mobility is very useful. Also vampires, gotta love vampires. They're what most, uh, what most games will evolve into, a mixture of tanks, banshees, and vampires, or goss hogs. That's gonna be the, the main combos you'll see. So let's talk about the walls for a moment. Now the walls are great, I love the walls. The lasers are awesome at getting some snipes on some tanks or you know holding your enemy at bay but in most competitive games if you're trying to play to win typically you take the walls less it's it's not as viable once everybody gets massive amounts of armies uh, having the walls there for just a few moments before a army of tanks or warthogs rolls up and just destroys you it's it's not going to be it's not going to hold them back However, if you're going for a super turtle, or you're just trying to defend and place some cobras up, you got a, you got some ODSTs ready, you're gonna have lots of fun, and uh, it can be very annoying to deal with if you don't have the proper leaders to counter a turtle. One of the strats I like to do with the garrisons on this map is not take the walls, but have an infantry go through the teleporter and take one of these three sniper towers. I feel that that gives you a little more information most people tend to ignore those towers and not worry about fighting those units. So you can get some free scouts. And if you're on the concrete side, you can actually see what that uh, center player is building. You'll get vision on his base. 14 is a delicate balance of applying pressure and giving your allies enough time to get their expansions up. Typically, you're going to see the Covenant players go on the offensive and try to distract the opponents for as long as possible while your teammates are getting their, their hog armies up, getting their upgrades ready, and that's what's gonna come in and seal the deal. So you wanna make sure you, you take an expo as early as you can and have the forces to defend that expo. You gotta, you gotta do that balance. So there's a million more things I could say about 14. And again, I'm, I'm not really into the super competitive scene of Halo Wars, so I'm sure I'm missing a few things here and there. But I think we can all agree that 14 is just a great map. I would say the best 3v3 map, and in my opinion, the best map in the game. Well, folks, we've made it quite a long way, and if you made it to the end, I just want to thank you for 
supporting me and helping this channel grow. It's been about three years since I started this channel and the amount of growth and love and support has just been insane. So I wanna shout out some of my viewers here. Thank you guys so much for always stopping by streams, giving me support, sending me nice messages. And yeah, keep it up. I'm gonna keep playing Halo Wars as, as long as I want to and I'll definitely be making some more content for you guys. So thanks again. This is your boy Turnip and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.